Happy Monday! We are on our way to the end of the school year. Whether that brings you anxiety or excitement, we are cheering for you. This week, there are a lot of opportunities to support our SWE athletics. On Wednesday, baseball and lacrosse will be playing at home at 6 p.m. Baseball will also be at home on Friday at 6 p.m. and on Saturday at 1 and 4 p.m. You can catch softball as well on Saturday at 2 and 4.30 p.m. Don't forget that SWE Olympic is April 18th, so get your teams ready to compete. Volleyball and intramurals also begin tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. in the Warrior Pit. You can check out your team on IM Leagues. You can see QR codes around campus for the Student Satisfaction Survey. This helps SLU to improve and hear your voice. To fill out the form, please scan the QR code and walk through the survey. As we begin our time together, let's reflect on these words from John chapter 7. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Let's sing together and worship today.
Good morning, my name is Heath, and this is Meredith. And we are here on behalf of staff, staff council. And one of the cool things as part of our worship today, it's a good thing when we can honor people uh, in their service to the Lord. And so we're here today, today to announce our staff member of the year. And the full presentation with all the glitz and glamour will be at a later date. But we thought it was important to announce it in front of the whole student body because uh, this is an award that students, faculty, and staff all vote on. And uh, the person who won this year is very awarding, uh, very, very awarding? Very awarding. Very, very deserving. Very Thank deserving. you. Deserving. Um, so they, they get a lot of things. Meredith, can you share just kind of some of the prizes that prizes. they get? Yeah. So one of the wonderful things about um, Staff Member of the Year is they get a beautiful plaque, which we'll present at a different time to put on their desk. They also get money. They get a little bit of money, and they get a week vacation on SWOO. So that's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. And uh, the person that we're going to honor this year, I was trying to think of just a few things I could say. Uh, everyone here at our university works really, really hard. They work really long hours, and we do it because it's a call. Uh, we do it because we feel like the Lord has called us here. And there, there are times when uh, I think of this person as our Kobe, like they're the first person here and the last person to leave. They are always working. And I know as hard as I'm working, that somewhere they're working hard. And it just drives me to do more. It drives me to be better. It drives me to serve school in a more full manner. And uh, Meredith was supposed to make sure they are here today. But will you join me in congratulating your staff member of the year, Michaela Michaela Wood. This is awkward. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for being here. I'm so, so honored. Um, if you guys didn't know, if you didn't check your emails, um, which I didn't because I didn't know I was even considered for this until Caleb Southern said, congratulations. I said, for what? And yeah, he's like, you're on like the list for a staff member of the year. And I was like, do I even qualify for that? Um, but I just want to talk just for a second about the other two candidates. If you got to see them in your email, one um, is Adam Ladd and the other Regina Bolding. And I just, I want to recognize them too because they embody, yeah, can we do that? Seriously. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think they were working here when I came here as a freshman. <laughs> so uh, they have such longevity in this place and such institutional knowledge. Um, I think I call Adam like once a week <laughs> for something. If you don't know Adam, uh, he is part of our sa campus safety team, but he's also been a part of maintenance. He literally knows what every button on the entire campus is for. Like if I need to know what key needs to go where or what, but like he's here. Uh, he's here for me. He's here for you guys. Um, you don't see him. Maybe you see his name on like parking tickets um, here and there, and that's why that might be how you know him. Um, but an incredible heart to serve you guys behind the scenes. Regina, Regina has a hard task. Um, she gets to organize all the faculty, um, <laughs> and that's super fun because she's a boss at it. Like she, you know, when they like march in like during graduation. 
Like, she makes sure they're in line, like, by whatever order it is that she's come up with. Um, but he, she also makes sure that you guys have the classes, the class schedules that you can take. She helps you to navigate, like, hey, uh, maybe I'm not doing well in classes. What should be my next step? She helps you guys academically. And so I just want to recognize them, too, because they're such powerful forces at this university, and they have helped me time and time again. And what that means by recognizing them um, is that any one of our amazing staff people could be awarded this. And so um, I'm just thankful. Uh, I want to start with that because I don't want to just, like, jump in and, like, be awkward. But I want to recognize that students, these, like he said, these faculty love you. They're here because they felt called by God to be here. S um, faculty and staff, like anybody who is a part of your lives, who's pouring into you, who works at this university, they're called here. And you could ask any one of them how God has led them to this space, and they would be willing to tell you. And so um, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the honor. But I just want you to know, like, there's a whole army of staff people who pray for you all daily and love being here um, and serving you. And so can we give all of the faculty and staff a hand this morning? I think we'll learn, uh, we'll learn who the faculty member of the year is a little bit later, so hold on for that. There's still fun news. Um, today I have the incredible opportunity when um, Quint and I were talking about um, some opportunities for you guys as students, um, we really felt like we wanted to turn our hearts and our minds for you guys towards baptism because in a couple of weeks, we're actually gonna have baptisms down at the track in the steeplechase. If you don't know what that is, that's like the water pit that they like run and jump through. And sometimes there's some videos online where they like trip over and like completely eat it. Yeah, that thing. Um, we won't do that to you if you're being baptized. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna have baptisms at the steeplechase. But I, before we like announce that and say, hey, sign up for this, I really want us to take some time to learn about what that is, what that means. So I realized that there might be some different groups of people in the room. One, um, a, a group that maybe you haven't put your faith in Christ before. Uh, maybe you're trying to figure out w who Jesus is, what he's like. Maybe do I want to sacrifice my life for him? They, t they keep talking at this university about giving my life to him or being saved. Um, but I'm trying to figure out what that means. Or I have no interest in it at all. There's another group here who has given their life to Christ who have taken that step of faith and said, I wanna follow him with everything that I have. And you've taken that step of faith even in a community setting and have been baptized before. And it was an incredible moment where your community celebrated with you and you're remembering that right now. Maybe it was for, in some traditions, maybe you got splashed with water, that's cool. For some traditions, maybe you got dunked, that's awesome as well. But there's this beautiful image of water within baptism that Jesus talks about throughout his entire ministry, but is also mentioned in scripture as a whole. Now, there's another group of us as well. And, and I don't want to, uh, like, I, I don't want to leave that group alone. I want to call us to a, this space, too. There's those people who have returned to the water again and again and again and again. And that's super awesome because you are finding new things in Christ to stand firm in. And, and maybe you've wavered in your faith and decided to return and recommit your life to Christ and you want to get baptized again. That's awesome. But you keep coming back to the water, back to the water, back to the water, um, back to baptism. And for you guys, I want to say that's awesome. I love that you're recommitting your hearts to that. But I would also challenge you of like, what steps further in your faith can we take so that it's not this cycle of re-repentance. It's this continual walking in freedom and holiness and the goodness that God has set before us because we know that when we give our lives to Christ, we're a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And so how do we walk in this newness of life? That would be my challenge for you all today. Here's a fun fact about me. I do not like the beach or the ocean. So if you know me, if you've ever had a conversation, a deep conversation with me, or we've talked about my four questions, you can ask me what those are later on, you know that I'm not a fan of the beach. And, and let me tell you why. I've had a little bit of a traumatic experience with the ocean um, before. So when I was pretty young, I found myself an experience that made me just not a huge fan of the ocean whatsoever. So I was about eight years old and I was pretty daring. I, I take risks, I love it. Um, so I decided 
one day at the beach. I was going to like leave my family on the shore. They knew that I was going into the water, but I wanted to go past the point where I couldn't touch like the bottom. Like I couldn't feel the sand on my feet because I, I, want, I wanted to see what that was like. So I swam out, I like crashed through the waves and got to like the very calm part of the ocean. Um, I could see the waves going in to the shore um, and I was like, man, this is, this is pretty cool. So I'm hanging out and then it's time uh, to come back to shore. We had to go home, grab dinner um, or something like that. And so mom called me in. She's like, Michaela, come on in. And so I start swimming. I still can't touch. I'm like, eventually I'll touch soon. So I keep swimming and I keep swimming. I keep, so I'm like, this is taking a long time. I went really further than I thought that I went. But I keep swimming and I pop up. Like I, I can still see the shore, but it's like getting smaller. So I don't really know what's going on. And then I hear my mom's voice from like, hey, come on, to like yelling like she's concerned. And I'm like, mom, I'm literally trying my hardest to like swim here, to stop yelling at me. I'm doing my best. Uh, what I didn't know at the time is that I was caught in a tide that was taking me straight out to sea. And I, I couldn't tell. All I was focused on was exerting every piece of my energy to get back to shore. And so as I kept swimming, as my mom kept yelling out to me, like, come on, come on, she started to realize that I couldn't do it by myself. Um, and I was getting further and further and further away, and I couldn't touch. I, like, I had no ability to get myself back on shore, and I was scared to death. Um, I thought for sure I was going to be lost at sea, and that was going to be it. Um, and so I would join all the fish in some type of way. Um, but she grew more concerned, and she cried. She knew that she couldn't come out. That she wasn't strong enough of a swimmer to come get me. So she cried out um, to someone on the beach who was tall um, and who could come and get me out of the water. And so, as I was exerting every piece of my energy trying to get back, I needed someone. I needed someone to come get me. My mom asked a stranger <laughs> to come out into the water to get me because he was able to touch the bottom and and, and drag me back in. Um, and I remember that moment so specifically. I don't remember his face. I don't remember his name. I don't remember anything about him. But what I do remember is his hand gra reaching out, me grabbing it, and holding on to his arm for dear life as he walked me back to shore until I could touch again. And I, that's such a, I'm so thankful for him because I'm living today because of him. I am not in the ocean forever and ever. Um, and I will not go that far into the ocean ever again. Um, but I think this is a picture. If we can just take this as a picture of who we are in sin without Christ, like can we draw that conclusion? Like some of us are in spaces it, and have been in spaces where we've been, we've been doing our life on our own. We're like, we can do this without touching the ground. And we're swimming because we feel like we're strong enough. And then we come to a point where we realize that we're too far out and we can't get back. And in that moment, that's what Jesus' work on the cross has done so that he might come reach out to us in our sin and pull us back to shore where he is, not just as a stranger now, but in relationship with us so that we might know how to walk with him. That is the gospel. That's what Jesus paid for. That's what we talk about in the season of Easter. That's what we think about during the season of Lent, how broken we are. We just talked about it. Ash Wednesday through Easter, we as a community spent time looking at sin, what that means for us, and our need for a Savior. And that makes the cross so powerful for each and every one of us. And so that's the hope of the gospel that actually hangs on the symbol of baptism. When we realize that we're too far out and we cry out to the Lord, we say we can't save ourselves, our lives need to change because we see something that's not right. And in that moment, Jesus reaches out his hand because he's already paid for that relationship with him and that salvation for a changed life we can grab hold of him and start to run. That's the powerful thing about Jesus. And we have this beautiful thing called baptism. It's called a sacrament or a means of grace, if you will, is another way. Baptism is this outward sign of an inward work, a means of grace, a way that Jesus shows grace upon us as a symbol of something that he's already done inside of each of us. 
So uh, let's talk about that. First, baptism is an outward side sign of this inward grace, and it has been God's plan for that for a very long time. Since the moment that we fell, he wanted to reach out his hand. Even in the garden, he cries out, where are you, where are you, where are you, and we're the ones that hide every single time. So baptism is a symbol of the Lord reaching out uh, and us taking his hand, but also we'll talk about how it's also this association with both his death and his resurrection. Let's look at his plan from way back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 36. Um, This is starting in verse 25. It says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Not just that. Here's what else he says. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove this heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And then in verse 27, he says this. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and be careful to obey my rules. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets are speaking about this renewal that we get to experience through the Holy Spirit, through the work of the cross. Um, And we will have clean water sprinkled on us. Does that remind you of baptism a little bit? There's figures of speech about water all throughout Scripture. Jesus calls us Um, to be fountains of living water. If you were here for the announcement video, that was part of uh, the scripture in that video. Uh, He himself is that living water. Jesus himself, before he begins his ministry, his public ministry, he goes to um, his cousin John and he is baptized as well. Now, he he goes and spends about 40 days in the wilderness being tempted, um, but this beautiful moment of the beginning of his public ministry starts with baptism. Jesus himself was willing to partake in that. So that means that it's something special. God has a cleansing for us, a sprinkling of this water to wipe us clean from those, those things that are destroying us, the sin, the shame, the guilt, the trauma from other people. He has a plan for each of that. And if we look back, he also has this this plan to make us completely new. He says, I'm going to take this heart of stone that is inside of you that is running away from me and I have a plan to give you a heart of flesh that is moldable, that wants to run to me and be part of what I'm doing in the world. So God has this redemptive work plan for each and every one of you as well as for me. And for us living in this time, that work is complete. Jesus completed it on the cross, and it is a gift given to us if we just take it. It opens up his heart to us, and it has always been the heart of God to do this inward work in each and every one of us, to take us from a place where we are trying so hard to get back to shore, but realize that we can't make it on our own, and then he can step in and change everything. And he can drag us back to the place where we belong, but not just back to shore and say, okay, what now? But a life that moves forward with purpose and with goodness and with the love of Christ. You see, baptism isn't just in this inward sign or outward sign of an inward work of grace. It's also this association, this beautiful association with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I'm gonna, we're going to unpack Romans 6 because Paul goes here um, in these verses. So if you guys have your Bibles, we're going to actually hang out here for a few minutes. Um, so if you guys will go to Romans chapter 6, and this starts in verse 1. Um, Paul's talking about sin. That's a good thing to talk about when you're talking about baptism. Uh, he's talking about sin, and he also uh, he poses this question. He says, what shall we say then? talking about righteousness and the work of Christ. Shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Like, should we give sin to God on a silver platter so that he can be glorified and we can say, how great are you to take sin away? Like an out to sin so that God can work a piece of grace in us. 
uh, it, Paul says, by no means. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> um, how can he who died still live in sin? That's a very interesting question. How can we who died to sin still live in it? That makes me question, what, like, what does that mean, Paul? If we're dead to sin, how can we still live in it? Well, isn't it inescapable? Like, isn't it something that we're always going to struggle with? I think sin is always something that is a temptation for each of us. Let's see what he says. He poses a really good question. Verse 3. Do you know, not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Did you guys know that? Did you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Let's stop right here. What in the world is Paul saying? He's saying that baptism is this symbol of what has happened within us where we are associating first with Christ's death on the cross for our sins. Because if we don't recognize that what he was paying for on the cross is what we deserve, then we miss the point of salvation and baptism in itself. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, what he was paying for was the entire sins of all humanity who had put his trust in him. And so for us, when we partake in baptism, we're saying, I agree with you, Jesus. I agree that I've sinned. I agree that I can't save myself. And so I'm laying my sin at the cross for you because you're the only one that can pull me out of the water. So I lay down all of these things, what, no matter how embarrassing or awful or shameful they feel, I know that they fit on the cross with you because you took on the shame and you took on the death that I deserve. And so, Lord, I agree with you. I confess that I have done things that are sinful, that I deserve death, but I also accept that you on the cross died for that and I'll let you I'll let you die for that because I know that I can't do it on my own and I know that you offer this as a gift and that's a hard place to be that moment of confession <laughs> and repentance where all of your heart is on the table I want to remind you what was said in Ezekiel that that heart of stone that you lay before God he wants to replace with this beautiful heart of flesh. He has a good thing for you when you lay down those things that burden you, when you lay down those sins that entangle you because he breaks those chains. He wipes and cleanses that sin. He, we read that in Ezekiel as well, remember? So we associate with him in his death. That is the lowering, right? That action, if you've been dunked, um, that lowering of someone into the water, we are associating and showing this beautiful symbol that we choose to die with Christ, we choose to let our sin be on the cross with him and go to the grave with him and be paid for. But then look what happens next in this verse. But just as Christ was raised by the dead, by the glory of the Father, that's what we celebrate in Easter, the stone was rolled away, and he was brought back to fullness of life, Jesus was. We too get to walk in that newness with him. That's the raising back up of someone. We don't wanna baptize someone and just leave them there. Um, some people might need to stay a little longer, but um, <laughs> I know I do, I, I needed to. <laughs> uh, but with, with the action of laying our lives down, Jesus and his completed work has done the action of raising our lives up in brand new newness of life. We read that throughout scripture. You, in, uh, you are a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come, right? We are literally walking in the newness of life that Jesus himself has paid for. Let's, let's keep reading. Thanks for sticking there for a second with me. Verse five, for if we've been united with him in death, like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. You see, 
If we associate with him in death, we also associate with him in life. And he gives us this newness of life. He's reiterating that. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Crucified with him, our old self, those things that we ran to for our own desires and our own selfish ambitions was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. What does that mean? That it might be brought to nothing? Why? So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. What does that mean? That means when Jesus went to the grave, I believe he took our sin with him. Can we agree on that? Right, if we lay down our sin at the cross, he takes our sin to the grave. When he raises from the grave, guess what he rose without? Sin. What does that mean our sin is? Where is it? Left in the grave where Jesus left it and he didn't come back with it. That is the victory of Christ. That he raised from the grave without any of our sin. So what does he have to offer? Nothing but life. Not putting old sin back on us, that is the work of the enemy trying to tempt us in, this, in a new life that we might walk after giving our lives to Christ and uh, showing this outward symbol of baptism. We are no longer enslaved to that. Why? Because Jesus finished the work and left the sin in the grave and raised to new life without it. It's gone. Like, he really left it. And for you and me, that means something. That means we can actually walk in newness of life and be successful at it, walk in the spirit, start to believe and do new things. How do we do that? How do we do that? I'll leave Romans 6 here. I wanna talk a little bit in Colossians 3. Paul also talks about how, how do we walk in this newness of life? Like, how do you leave the sin in the grave and continue to walk a new life? He, he says in chapter 3, starting in verse 1, this isn't on the screen, but listen to these words. He says, if you've been raised with Christ, th seek the things that are above, right? If you've been raised with him, like associated with him in death, raised with him to life, here's what you do. You seek the things that are above where Christ is, because that's where he is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not those things that are on earth that you used to set your minds on. For you have died. Your old life has died and your new life is hidden in Christ who is in God. You are in Christ. When, you, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. You see the future that God has planned for us? When Jesus comes back, we get to associate with him in his final glory. It's beautiful. So therefore, he says, put to death what is earthly in you. And he has a list, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is adultery, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with this practice. And then, so he has this list of things that we, we shouldn't associate with. And then he says, but put on then. God's chosen ones. This is what it looks like to put on Christ and walk in this newness of life. Compassionate hearts for one another. Kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. If someone has a complaint against each other, forgive one another as the Lord has forgiven you. You must also forgive. And above all of these, put on love, which binds all of us in perfect harmony. We can we can walk in newness of life if we put our lives in Christ and trust him as the author and perfecter of our faith daily. And baptism is a symbol of the start of that. You see, baptism is an invitation to the community of believers and the mission of Christ. Let's look at the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Um, he says this uh, in verse 18, all authority, this is Jesus, he's speaking to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me awesome now what go therefore and make disciples of all nations cool we got that then he says baptize them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit make sure that it's in my name because i want them to be in me because i'm the only one that can bring newness of life is what he's sharing with them cool that's the end of the great commission no there's more there's more than just bapti baptizing people baptism isn't the end of the journey 
He says, then teach them to observe all I've commanded. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. It's not just baptism. There's this process of what we call sanctification, which is becoming more and more like Jesus every day. Another reason or another way that we walk in this when we're raised up and walk in this newness of life is we have the affirmation of other believers. Baptism is super cool because you have a family of people that are celebrating this newness of life with you. It's like a party with the angels in heaven because they're already excited for one person to come to Christ. But you have a whole community cheering for you. Not only that, you have a whole community that is able and willing to walk with you in accountability. I remember in, um, I grew up in the United Methodist Church. And when um, one of the young kids were baptized, we'd sing this song. And so for me, um, when I was baptized in that, in that space, they would sing this. Michaela, Michaela, God saves you. God helps you, protects you, and loves you too. We, your family, love you so. We vow to help your faith to grow. Michaela, Michaela, God saves you. God helps you, protects you, and loves you too. I don't know if any of you from the UMC remember that. Um, it's in the hymnal if you want to go look at it. Um, I think that's such a beautiful thing to sing over someone. Um, I did not sing it well. That's why I don't sing up here. But um, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful uh, way to express what we as a body of believers dive into when we celebrate someone getting baptized. We recognize with them that God loves them and cares for them but that we love and care for them too and want to walk this life with them. So today, wherever you are, whether you've been baptized before, whether you keep coming to the water, and it's like that, uh, like for some of us, it's like, you know that game when you're uh, in a pool with your friend and they're like holding you like a baby and um, you have to guess what color that they're thinking of and every time that you guess it wrong, you like get dunked. Like, that's not what baptism is, okay? <laughs> like, you're not trying this guessing game and you, and you get dunked every time you get it wrong until you get it right. No, like, Christ paid for our salvation once for all. For him, he's sure. For him, it's done. And for you, it's a gift. So no matter where you are today, I want to invite you to baptism. Um, maybe that's remembering your baptism. Maybe that's being baptized for the first time. Maybe that's... Um, needing to rededicate your life, um, and we can talk about that too. And so there will be a place for that. Um, actually, next week on Thursday or Friday, we'll send some information out. If the Lord is tapping on your heart in this moment to take part in baptism, we'd love to celebrate that with you. Um, and so be looking in your emails, be looking in spaces where we can gather together. Remember, baptism is this outward sign of an inward grace. It's this association, this unity with the death and the resurrection of Christ that brings newness of life and you are a new creation. And, it, and also, it opens up this opportunity for us to take part in the mission of Christ with the body of Christ. So let's get after it. And let's make those decisions together and celebrate one another. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your baptism. We thank you for the cleansing of your water and of your spirit, Lord Jesus. I pray for those who are contemplating giving their lives to you, that they would make that decision today. Lord, and that we may celebrate with you. Call out those um, who you are asking to be obedient in baptism in, in this moment. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for our time together. We thank you for this symbol of your grace. Would you continue to work us together as new creations in you. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. One minute over. You guys go to class. <laughs>